office of uh, the STEM or Chief Architect. And so we're here to talk a little bit about So we're here to talk a little bit about um, what we've been up to for the last year and a half or so. We launched just in December. Um, so we came from internet company roots, and we did that for a while and realized um, we wanted a lot more impact. We, we didn't set out to be a nonprofit to help people get out of debt. We really wanted to do something that could have um, a lot of impact, to help a lot of people. Um, we did that with Ruby and open source. So that's kind of here, what we're here to talk about today. So you haven't heard about payoff, and that's not uh, terribly surprising. So we started in 2009. Um, we, again, were an internet company. We were trying to do personal finance management. So, so kind of think of Mint.com, but we did it with badges and um, kind of behavior change. So we really wanted to uh, help consumers get out of debt, number one. But we were trying to do it with positive reinforcement and game mechanics. So think of Mint um, you know, with achievements. So instead of you know, killing 50 zombies and being a badge, if you made um, six payments on time, you get a badge. Or if you save more money than you spent this month, then you get a badge. And so that was kind of payoff 1.0. Um, but payoff 2.0 is kind of what we, we set out to build. That's the piece that we built on top of the Ruby stack. age 28 and age 58, 
nothing really happens in those years, right? So you don't do anything anymore or anything. So, um, so payoff at its core is the financial empowerment company. We really want to get people off this debt treadmill where you're paying just enough each month to not accumulate more debt. And so that's what payoff is really about. You know, so this, this ties really to our core. Um, we're not a nonprofit. We believe that making a profit, being sustainable, helping the customers, and we're a venture back company, so making a return for our investors are not mutually exclusive. We really believe that we can do all these things. And really, there's no secret to it. It's just don't be greedy. But that's all it comes down to. And so, we'll talk a little about what Payoff 1.0. And so, here's a screenshot. This is circa 2010 or so, so it's really payoff -y. And the balloons used to animate the CSS animations. And um, yeah. But this is the part that I wanted to start sharing with you. So, it was half a million lines of code. Um, it was definitely falls into the monolith category. Um, we had 0% test coverage. So, every time we <laughs> I used to keep a cold beer in the fridge for one of two reasons. Either it could be a celebration that I, I survived, or um, I really needed it after each deployment. Um, it was two weeks to deploy a simple feature. So if I just wanted to display one additional, let's say, spending metric, I wanted to put a, a widget on there that said how much you spent on coffee this week. That would take me two weeks um, with 10 engineers, um, offer engineers. And so it was really, 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 really painful. Um, it would take our two QA analysts um, two full days to do a full regression of the site. Um, so it was mostly manual, and, and you know it was painful. So it was really painful. And so what we realized um, after we hired a couple more engineers, we were hiring um, pretty senior engineers at this point. Um, but the, the gist for us was um, we couldn't keep doing this. We were cool and insane. Um, and so we made a decision. Um, with myself, Stan, and one other engineer, and we're going to rewrite this thing. Um, but we kind of did it uh, under the radar. Um, we didn't tell anyone. So eight weeks of spare time, um, nights and weekends, um, we wrote a Rails proof concept. And so Stan and I have used Rails before, but never in production environment. It was just always for a kind of a hobby project. We throw something up on Heroku. because it was never anything big. So over eight weeks, we wrote this 40,000 um, line, 70% test coverage. It was 80 percent feature complete from our initial prototype. So we did all the typical things you think of in the PFM, counting <coughs> and displaying balances and all those things. But we went back and we did a very, very modern tech stack. So Rails 4, Postgres, Angular, Angular Redis, um, the way that we really wanted to do it. And so this was kind of foreshadowing. We didn't know what was going to happen next. And so we knew that we just needed something different and just to get our sanity back, really. And so it was really kind of a, a surprise when our CEO came to us um, about two months after we finished the prototype and said, hey guys, we're going to become a lender. And we said, wait, you were, we're an internet company. Um, no one on the team has any experience lending or getting a dollar back, which is the hard part, by the way, because you can lend money all day long. You can pay it back to the too. And so you know, we said, well, we're all a bunch of tech guys, we have a couple marketing guys, but we have no one in finance at all. And so the audacious goal was to become a lender. We said, okay, we'll do it in a year. Yeah, that's a little aggressive. You already know the title of our talk, it's 16 months. So that's how long it actually took us. But you know, we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. You know, so what kind of compliance aspects did we need? What kind of security did we need? Um, you know, we didn't even know this we were making on day one if there would be the correct decision of six days six months later. And so we started digging into it. So we spent six months digging into it. Um, this diagram up here, we call it the sausage diagram. No one wants to know what goes into the sausage. Um, really damn scary thing about this. This is the 50,000 foot view. This is not the detailed view. Um, this is what it looks like when you zoom out. So on the left is when a lead comes in from the internet, and the right is a completed loan. And each of these boxes break into more scary diagrams that look like this one. Um, and so we really didn't know what we were getting into. But the, thing, the one thing we did know was that this was definitely a marathon. It was certainly not a sprint. And so we knew that we had to do this in some sustainable way. Otherwise, after we implemented it, we wouldn't have the team that we had anymore. They'd all quit and walk out. Um, no 
that we believe he hosts. And so one of the things that we were really blessed with is that many times we've actually sat down and thought about culture. So a lot of people will tell you culture is something you can't create that's organic, which is true. But you need this nurturing environment for this to occur. And so we were really lucky because we actually sat and thought about these um, before we decided to become a lender. And so we started thinking, well, what's really important to me? So, you know, unlike a lot of other startups, we're not a bunch of 20-somethings sitting around in the garage, pounding Red Bulls. Um, we have families. We have kids. We have spouses. Um, and so we realized, okay, families are really at the core. And we knew that, you know, we were competing. We were located in Playa Vista, um, up on the west side of LA. And so we were competing with, at the time, MySpace. Um, and Google and Santa Monica and the whole Silicon Beach and then in Irvine we're competing with another yet another Google and we're competing with you know, Blizzard and a bunch of other shops and so we're competing for the talent and again we were creating possibilities so what were we going to do so we realized that um, you know, telecommuting was really important a lot of people value telecommuting they value the flex time so we live in LA so we all hated traffic so we didn't want to sit in traffic so the idea of being in the office at 8.30 or 9 and sitting on the 405, for those of you being uh, from LA, you know, that just didn't appeal to us. So we knew, you know what, it doesn't matter. Just be here for a few hours and work for us have some face-to-face -face time and collaborate. Um, we knew we didn't want to create documentation. So we'd all done Fortune 500 stints and created mountains of Word documents that were obsolete as soon as we wrote them. So we knew conversations were really important. Um, so if you go to the website, you can see all the couches. We actually have a to one couch ratio, sorry, two desks to one couch ratio in the office, so that's how important it is for us to, to sit and be able to talk to each other. Um, we knew the work and play were related, so this is one of those things that is organic, it's craft beer Thursday, so every Thursday around four or so, um, we crack open some craft beers, and uh, we have a beer trader who lives in the office. But, you know, we just, it's, it's our way of, Meeting management, meeting marketing, um, meeting the product team, really sitting down with people who typically don't interact with them week, and just having something where we able to chat. Um, and then Flat organization is just lip service, which we mean. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in um, upcoming slides. So, Stan and I um, have read all these books, um, and particularly Rework. We, again, I mentioned earlier that we hired a lot of Fortune 500s. And so, um, Rework is one of the first books we hand them on starting day and say, you need to unlearn almost everything that you've learned from Fortune 500s um, and you know, come to work with a different attitude. So, for us, we really took a lot of these ideas from um, very formally known as 37 Signals from Etsy and from a bunch of other shops and kind of based a lot of our um, thinking on some of those um, kind of founding fathers of, uh, of startup culture. And I mentioned earlier about equal seats at the table. So the thing I think is um, a common theme in a lot of other financial institutions is that they happen to have an IT department. And so IT becomes this organization and company that just gets in the way. So I want to release this new product, or I want to release this new marketing product, or I want to do this, you know, whatever it is, and IT is in the way. Um, so if you guys haven't read Phoenix Project, that's an excellent book, and kind of giving the perspective of how IT is perceived in a lot of these other organizations. And so we brought up a couple of other people to the table as well, so science. Um, so we have, um, the chief scientist from New Harmony who works and leads our scientific team. And so, um, you know, we have the thought, a lot of thought leaders in finance uh, working for us. Basically, people we brought in from the financial industry that understand the constraints and some of the complexities and compliance issues. We're willing to leave some of that, those opinions, and that's the way we always did it at the door, um, and basically relearn. Um, so, we really do have. Um, a lot of grounding in terms of you know, all voices matter, and that diversity and thought is something that we really, really value. And so what that adds up to is payoff 
is trying to restore humanity to finances. And so one of the challenges to hiring is, um, I'll give you an example. Is there anyone from Hire.com? Yeah, okay. So Hire.com categorizes companies by um, industry. And so one of the things we always get is, I don't want to be part of the finance industry. And my response is always, give me 10 minutes. I swear, I don't want to be in the financial industry either. But here's how we're different. And so, you know, greed is just something that just is at the core of a lot of these companies. That's something that just really, really bothers us. And then a lot of these companies are built on mainframe technologies. And so when you have these types of companies, yeah, you're going to get people that are, um, I shouldn't tell this with the story. So have you ever called into your bank and the agent says, you know, please wait while my system loads up your record. What the hell is that? Why am I waiting in this day and age for a record to load up? Um, and the agent wants to tell me, I'm sorry, but my system seems to be having a case on Mondays. Like, I don't mind that. And I just want to reset my password for the website. Why is it so difficult? And so we really feel that technology, just humanity, really needs to be restored to the industry. And that's the kind of thing that we're espousing. So, this is probably the exact, if, you're, if you stayed behind for the Shopify talk, this is probably the exact opposite um, advice that they just gave you. And so for us, it really means we need to survive in order to hit scale. And so average transaction size for us is $15,000. This isn't an eyeball business. Stan and I both came from eyeball businesses. We used to you know, work on Motor Trend where you know, lots and lots of eyeballs meant more banner ad impressions. But this is a completely different business for us. And so, um, we figured, well, Rails is good enough for Cookpad. It's, it's going to be good enough for us because in terms of pure eyeball, we're really um, not going to get to that point. And so for us, modularity for agility is something really, really important to us. Uh, the assumption here is that we're going to throw away a lot of these pieces as we learned. And so we need just enough learning to get off the ground, to be compliant, to be secure. But a lot of these pieces over time, we knew we were going to replace. And so the emphasis for us was really building lots and lots of really small things. And that's what was really important to us. So, um, test coverage is an obvious must. In order for us to switch out these pieces, kind of up in the air. Um, so, if you imagine doing risky things like changing out how you decision a loan application, how you decide who you lend money to, some of these things have thousands and thousands of test cases. And so, we, uh, we put a lot of emphasis into test coverage. Um, and if we have time at the end of it, we'll, we'll dive into tech stack and everything and answer any questions we have about that too. Um, APIs and microservices are really, really, really important to us. We run on our own gem servers. So, um, almost everything that we have is a packaged gem for ourselves, too, in order for us to switch these things out. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, reducing mean time and recovery. The gems are also a big part of that for us in order to be able to switch out version things. And then um, vendors will dive into an entire section on, but the key thing here is we wrapped um, every single vendor integration we have and then pulled abstractions out of it. So there's usually more than one vendor for each of the things that we do. Um, so we pulled out the business abstractions for it, add an account, um, you know, remove an account, things like that, and actually um, insulated ourselves from those vendor integrations. And that's something that's really, really important, um, I think, for almost anyone dealing in a mature industry. And then speed of iteration is one of the most important things. So we took a lot of notes from Etsy. Um, and so Etsy, yeah, they're not part of the Rails community, but they have a lot of ideas that we really um, found really, really important. I think the main thing being automating um, almost everything they have. Um, so in terms of deployments, testing, IT automation, so we use Chef to build our servers. Um, deployments, we use, um, we used to use Capistrano, we're using Minute now. Um, and testing, we're using Capybara, our specs, Selenium. Um, and we're also evaluating Robot, which is a Python testing framework. Feature flags is something that um, We've been learning, um, but we've gotten some good success on. So, feature flag is basically just a switch for some code. And so, it lets you separate deployments from launch. So, that's really key, right? So, when your code hits production, that's not when you have to pay attention. You can actually switch it so that you turn on the feature when your engineers are in the house or when everyone you need is around. And so, um, it's just something that we've been trying to espouse. Um, and that obviously also goes with deploying smaller bits of code. So you can push code out to production and do what's called dark deployments. Um, and get a lot more confidence. So all these things are basically just trying to maximize the amount of confidence you have. Because again, 
we're coming into a very um, highly regulated, um, very you know, high risk and high cost for screw ups. Right? So if you screw up, you lend to the wrong person. Um, that can really bite you in the butt. And then monitoring is obviously something that you um, need as well. So you need to go see how things are reacting after you turn on a feature flag, or even if you screw up a little bit. Um, and then lastly, again, compliance. So there's some pieces that you can move really, really fast on. And just like Shopify and just like Etsy, there's pieces that are PCI compliance or SOC 2 compliance that you really need to carve out and move at a little bit slower pace in order for you to keep your compliance and keep the regulators happy. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Stan, who will talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing with our new stuff. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so pretty excited to be here. Uh, as we mentioned, we only started doing Ruby two years ago. I never thought we'd be uh, speaking to you guys already. So, uh, we started out. Yeah, yeah, sorry, so we started out with a team of really experienced developers. Um, we're all coming from corporate backgrounds with Java and C sharp experience, but we knew from the uh, proof of concept that we could, you know, pick up new languages. And Rails in particular was pretty easy, um, so it's kind of nice that we found something that we could leverage and kind of uh, give us the ability to achieve a really complicated goal, yet in a short time frame, like you know, the year that we had. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what was really useful for us. Um, number one thing is the Ruby community. And like I said, we came from Java, so you know, the bar's kind of set low, you know, work was kind of the dominant force over there. And they're not really that open and welcoming, but we were able from day one to really find like detailed blog posts or screencasts when I ran into a problem, um, just Google things. And the technologies that we chose also had people who were very willing to share information about them. So things like Metis and Elasticsearch. Um, if you ran into a problem, we were able to you know, kind of just fire it off an email to even like the people who wrote the gems. Uh, and that was a little surprising because you know normally when you're dealing with a vendor and you want to get something fixed or you have a question about like how does this work, how do we configure it, uh, they're not going to get back to you in like less than an hour. We would actually, you know, write to kind of famous reviewers or people who wrote like Keyless Gem for us and they would actually respond to us. And so I really encourage you guys, if you run into anything, to just kind of be willing to communicate with people because people are very willing to share knowledge within this community. Um, and of course, one of our favorites is Railscasts. <laughs> uh, I think we actually had this running joke for a while, you know, where uh, we would implement something and run into problems and like, oh man, that's kind of complicated. It took me a while to figure out. And I'm like, you know, I bet there was a Railscast on that. And then we actually search Railscast. I'm like, oh man, we shouldn't have wasted, you know, an hour trying to figure that out. We could have just learned it right there. Um, another great one for us was uh, Ruby Rose. And that podcast kind of really introduced us to a lot of different uh, tools in the community and people, uh, kind of books that we should be reading. Um, so that was a really good one. I'm not sure if you guys have listened to the podcast, but we are actually the same payoff. I almost killed one one. So I feel bad about that still. Let's see, what's well, hard for us? So I think a lot of you guys, or maybe some of you guys, are starting out and learning Ruby. So hopefully we can kind of share the things that are hard for us and I'll help you out. Um, when you're learning a language, it's a lot more than you know just the syntax. For us, there's kind of like this whole ecosystem that you have to learn. There's tooling, um, kind of best practices. So for us, we had to kind of go to Git. Full requests were kind of you know a little bit foreign for us. It took us a little while to get our heads wrapped around working in that manner. Um, we also went more from kind of the X unit type of testing to BDD with our spec, and it takes a little while to do that as well. In the beginning, we had a lot of code that was syntactically correct, and I don't know, from the Java world, you have kind of a static compilation, and it would tell you, okay, it compiles, but that doesn't really tell you that you know everything is working the way it should. And with Ruby, there's more of a duct type, and everything's kind of dynamic, and it took us quite a long time to kind of like change our mindset in order to write code that looked less like Java, that was still syntactically correct Ruby, but more, you know, switching to like idiomatic Ruby. And we think the best way to do that is kind of just to read a lot of code. 
Yeah, eloquent Ruby is, I think, usually we, we throw them in, um, have a new engineer write some code, and then um, eloquent Ruby is, is usually on the required reading list pretty close um, to them starting to yeah. write Ruby. And that's, I think that's when everyone realizes, oh, my code looks like Java still. <laughs> Yeah, we start people out with uh, kind of just a whole two weeks of, hey, learn some stuff about, you know, you work in the meet these things and learn about the culture. So that's really big for us. Um, so I'm sure you guys are aware that, you know, hiring is very difficult these days. And with Ruby, it's actually even more difficult than we found um, because there's a smaller pool, at least uh, within Orange County. <coughs> most everybody is doing like C Sharp or Java. And uh, surprisingly, you know, when you tell them, hey, there's this cool language for me, you guys want to switch to it? You know, a lot of people were not that interested in uh, kind of learning something totally new. So we're happy that we find candidates that are, you know, are willing to embrace learning and have that agility to switch. Um, there's also a very interesting study that uh, the Harvard Business Review had about um, women. And they were not willing to um, kind of apply for jobs where they didn't feel like they already knew all the skills, and we actually learned from that. So we started rewriting kind of our job listings to actually say, hey, you know, come here and learn on the job. You know, you don't need to know every little bit as long as you're willing to learn. So, and uh, yeah, so another thing, growing pains, right? We started out with four engineers and kind of a small startup company, and a lot of Rails literature is talking about, you know, Kind of what uh, DHH was talking about, where it's kind of a monolithic application. And as you grow bigger, there's kind of this communication overhead. You have to start splitting things apart. So you have to kind of uh, take a critical view of which pieces of advice <coughs> apply to a system as you grow to kind of a small and easy business. All right, so let's talk a little bit more uh, about hiring. Um, we like really nice people. You know, that's. One of the things that uh, we try to hire for, but you know, is that really critical in a business environment? Um, shouldn't you be hiring for you know X years of experience instead, or someone who's really experienced with the finance industry? Um, well, we don't think so. We think culture is kind of the most important thing, and you know, you have to have this environment where people enjoy working in order to be successful. So, like, if we didn't get paid to go out there and work, would we still enjoy being with these people, building kind of the same things we're building? Um, so that's a question we ask ourselves a lot. And from my experience, and this may not be true everywhere, <laughs> it's uh, definitely possible to learn Ruby, and you can definitely, you know, jump into a domain and kind of pick up, you know, how that works and all that, but, like, I've never seen someone who is, you know, on a power trip or really rude or condescending change their ways, so we found that, you know, that was kind of a, it's not scientific, but it's pretty much, you know, a reason to choose nice over those other things when you're hiring. And uh, we have a good, you know, question that we ask ourselves when we're hiring and or interviewing somebody, and that's, uh, you know, the stuck on a plane question, as we call it. So if I was stuck on a plane with you for the next three hours, well, I still want to work with you. Um, you know, can I hang out with this person afterward and relax and, you know, is it kind of draining instead to be stuck talking to that person? And I think that's a really good litmus test. So, why are we talking about these things as if they were mutually exclusive? Um, you know, there are people who are, you know, nice, competent, and have domain knowledge. But uh, in our experience, especially <coughs> out in Orange County, it's really kind of a pick-and-choose thing. It's like the captain room of hiring, as I like to call it. Uh, you kind of have these three sliders, and you have to choose like which things to optimize for. And so we always go for competence and nice. So this is kind of what we ended up with. It's who we are. As you can see, we're a very diverse group. Um, this is actually really important. It's kind of surprising. There was a study recently that showed that if you have a diverse team, it would actually outperform a more capable and experienced team that, that had less diversity. So we felt like diversity is another thing that we should look for. And 
Um, what we built, I think, is a really diverse team of really capable people. And if we needed to, we'd let them learn the domain knowledge of the finance industry. And uh, we really didn't feel like we had to make any compromises to get this. So what do we look for when we hire? Um, provable competence. You know, you got to have somebody who is able to learn and, you know, reason about code. There's a certain kind of thinking that needs to be there, logical kind of reasoning. Um, we mentioned learning agility. So people who, you know, use a different language, but were able to kind of twist their minds around new things and apply themselves and learn Ruby. So that's fantastic. So polyglots are great. And I mentioned nice already. Uh, what you'll notice that we don't have up here are the traditional deal breakers of, say, X years of Rails experience, or, you know, you must be some sort of expert in the finance industry. We think those are kind of negotiable things and kind of optional when we're hiring. So, that brings us up to the uh, vendors can't keep up. So we're in the financial industry, um, but we kind of have really internet company kind of roots, and you'll see this like uh, with Airbnb and like uh, Uber, say, they're in these industries that are kind of entrenched, like established industries, but they're not really from the industries. They have a very different DNA, and uh, we kind of feel the same way. We're in the finance industry, but we're not really of that. Um, but the vendors, as it turns out, kind of are. You know? They're very successful because they're kind of the winners <coughs> of the last generation, right? Um, and because of that, they're, you know, a little bit slower than you know a new company would be. They're not as hungry. Um, they're basically doing what worked for them in the past, but things nowadays are a lot faster, and like you can't really make mistakes either. Because you know if you have a problem and the customer you know doesn't get a fix, they're gonna start tweeting about it, and uh, that's only if you're lucky. You know, the worst thing is like if you're a trending uh, topic on say Reddit, right? You're really, really screwed. So. Initially, we were really, really scared about building the hard pieces. Um, things like underwriting and loan management. So we didn't have the domain experience, and we figured, ah, you know, these vendors, they've been here for decades. They must know what they're doing. Um, but as it turns out, it's kind of more perception than reality. So they have this image of stability, and they're all kind of just like a giant rock that you can build on. But behind the scenes, they have a lot of different silos within the company. So. Maybe like their ops team doesn't talk to their dev team. We've had you know instances where like, hey, yeah, we fixed it. It's like, great, what's it going out? Like, oh, we don't know. You know, we have to talk to our ops team. Uh, we'll get back to you in like 48 hours. And I'm like, wow, you know, that's kind of really unacceptable. And uh, we learned pretty quickly that we should, you know, take in house all those things so we don't have to rely on uh, slow vendors. So here's an example of something that we <coughs> took in house. Uh, it's the credit policy, which is kind of how we approve loans. It's a piece that has a lot of high risk. It, you know, if you make or if you made an error, it would have you know a huge cost associated with it. Because basically every loan application that goes to the system goes through this process. And um, we also change it a lot. You know, as we learn new things, we make improvements to the credit policy. And just by in-housing it, we reduce the turnaround time for a change from two weeks down to two days. And it's not just about speed, too, because testability was vastly improved when we in-housed it. Um, we were able to gain confidence that way. We also found that SLAs are not very useful. So the best guarantee to, uh, you know, the best guarantee you can have, really, is being able to fix a problem. Meantime to recovery is the thing we really focus on. So with an SLA, you know, you're kind of your hands are tied. If there's a problem, you may be able to diagnose it, but there's nothing you can do to actually push a fix out there. And you're just basically burning the team's time and effort on a problem that you can't solve yourself. Uh, and that's a huge problem. And surprisingly, vendors are not that averse to eating the cost from this. And uh, you know, it's great for them because they don't have to you know, worry about things, but for us, you know, a small startup, it really kills you. And uh, this is a really good test as well. So we found there are some vendors out there that actually don't have a test environment, 
And you should really beware if they don't have test environments. <coughs> so I just want to end with a uh, chart visualizing kind of the timeline and gains that we got from in-house and things. Um, we found this to be true, you know, within our industry. But uh, we suspect it's also true of a lot of other established industries out there. So if you're a startup, you're probably trying to disrupt one of these industries. And we really encourage you to kind of you know, go out there and build it yourself and just have a lot of belief in yourself. Uh, so I'm going to hand this back to John now. Can we lie? We have six. It's a rounding error. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I mentioned earlier we're not uh, a bunch of programmers. Um, we're you know, people with families. Um, our engineering team is actually a quarter female, um, and so a lot of working moms. And so for us, you know, not having a life or not seeing our kids or not being able to do the things that we do, um, you know, there's a lot of people, there's multiple people coaching, you know, kids' teams, and there's multiple people who have passions. Almost everyone, I think, has a passion outside of just their job. Um, and so for us, that really meant a lot of, um, you know, not trading off things that we felt were really, really important. And again, that becomes one of those intangible things that's much harder to describe to a candidate that's interviewed. And so, you know, how did we do this? And so, you know, it was one thing just to say, yeah, family time is important, but that sounds pretty cut and dry, and it seems somewhat obvious to say out loud. But I will, I will say that Ruby really enabled us to do this. You know, being able to leverage a lot of open source, the language itself, obvious, if you the example I always use is what, how, how many lines of C-sharp does it take to open up a file, read some lines, and then output another file, right? And then how many lines does that take in Ruby? And so you take that and you multiply it over and over and over again, you add the test journey, um, kind of ethos into it, and how many times that saved your bacon, and then you add in just all the kind of the defaults that are just smart defaults out of the gems and the Rails communities, whereas with, you know, a lot of the other frameworks, you can do whatever you want, and you don't really have guidance for that. And it takes a lot more time to train as well. So there's generally a set established way of doing something, at least for the 12 months or so before a new version of Ruby, sorry, for 24 months until a new version of Rails comes out. And then automation, again, this is just something that's just really, really baked into the organization. But you know, this is how 20 engineers act like 80 engineers, is doing a lot of this automation. The other thing I didn't talk much about is um, high fidelity prototyping tools. So we use these prototyping tools to hand off from our product team to our engineering team. So rather than have, again, having nonsense of Word documents or wiki documents or whatever laying around, we do a lot of prototyping that we can use to do user testing to sit in front of actual customers and then also to communicate ideas between product and engineering as well. So fire drills. Um, so getting a phone call and, and you know, having to walk away from the dinner table or having your Saturday interrupted or having to carry your laptop um, in your car all the time, we think it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, and so even before um, you know, the, the speed science talk this morning, you know, Friday deployments has always been a rule of payoff, not because we can't deploy on a Friday, we can. Um, we just enjoy our weekends and we enjoy our Friday nights. And so again, feature flags um, is a really, really important one for us. You know, if DevOps finds issue or someone is on call, turn off the flag and go back to sleep. Do not wake up the entire engineering team at 2 a.m. on a Saturday night. It just doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, maybe it made sense in you know, 2004. This certainly doesn't make any sense today. Um, and so this is where we're at today. So we launched in December. Um, it took us 16 months um, to launch it. We went from 20 total employees to 80-something employees today, so you know, the rest of the company was pretty busy while engineering was building some of these pieces out. Um, Stan talked a little bit about the growing pains. Um, one, the, the other things we didn't touch on too much is when it's 20 people and you know every single person's name to 80 people, that's just a lot more relationships to groom. So if you think of people in your company as network nodes and the number of connections between 20 nodes and the number of connections between 80 nodes, um, how that goes up exponentially. And so, you know, for us, you know, this balance between life and work is totally achievable, and that's really what we're here to sell. We're not here to sell you the payoff loan. Um, if it fits for you, great, but what we're saying is that startup life has become something that is parodied on the TV show now, 
And so for us, we really think that there is a sustainable way to work for a payout for, uh, yeah, that'd be nice too, um, to work for a startup. And uh, you know, these things that you, you usually um, think that, you know, hey, does a company need to be ruthless to survive as a startup? You know, there's all these um, stories of these startup founders that are just ruthless. And they execute at, at all costs. And we say, you know what, we don't think it needs to be that way. Um, we think that you can have a family, and we think that there's the tools that exist in the, this community, and among others, to have a startup um, that you know, does good, that you can use technology to help people, and that's not mutually exclusive for profitability, um, or even making a return for your investors. And, and, and those things aren't evil either. Um, they all need to be kind of working together, um, and that's really what we're trying to sell here, is that it doesn't need to be that way. Um, this community has the tools in order to do that. So a quick recap. Um, again, <coughs> culture is something that you have to think of from day one. Um, scale will come later. You can retrofit scale with the cloud and with all the things that you have available today. It's a much different environment from the last time I attended RailsCoff in 2009. So you can retrofit scale now. And really, you should be building these things so you can um, swap it out. And so agility matters way more. I don't mean agile like Scrum or Kanban. I mean, Agile in the true sense of, hey, your founder might come in one day and say, you need to become a lender. And you're like, oh shit. Like, that's kind of different. Um, for us, we didn't have a choice. We had to teach people Ruby. Um, so that was something that was really, really important. Um, that we were able to train people and make people successful and get them through that transition if we hired the right people. And it also changed how we hired people. Nice, nice, nice matters a lot. And so um, instead of having egotistical arguments in the office about I'm right and my algorithm is better, the type of discussions that we have, heated discussions oftentimes, is that what is best for the customer? And those are the discussions that are most important. You have those, get heated over those things, but how do you help your customers instead of I'm right and you're wrong and my idea is better than your idea or this technology is better than this technology? Um, Five, I think the corollary, the corollary there is that you, if you have the right team and you're using the right stack, have more faith in yourself. Um, that's something that we didn't have from day one. We were really, really scared of the unknown, um, and so we had this over-reliance on, um, on vendors, and we just burned a lot of time. Um, as Stan said, we spent a lot of time in fixing their problems. And finally, um, you can have a life. So, Work with nice people is kind of the takeaway. So we hope that you know the things I said I, I feel are, are common sense. You know, if, if I say them out loud, you all kind of nod and like, yeah, you should work with nice people. That totally makes sense. But for some reason, every job that I've had, that just isn't true. There's someone backstabbing me. There's someone um, out to get me, or they're asking me to trade my family time, or to make these trade-offs, and we just don't get it. So at the payoff, we don't think that should be the way. So. Um, we take, I think we have a little bit of time, we have two minutes for questions. Um, happy to answer any questions about staff and technology and stuff too. Yeah, a little bit of detail on your pointed out vendors, which is pretty interesting. That, that goes against a lot of wisdom you hear from a lot of, especially startup people. Uh, and I, I actually do uh, payments in Egypt, so I know a lot of what we're talking about. We have, we have payment centers that don't, that don't have testing environments, we don't like them. Uh, but sometimes not using vendor is pretty hard because it means you have to have a deal with the next guy at the chain or something like that. So can you give any specific examples or you know, spin that out a little bit? I'm going to take the high road and not mention ex specific examples, but yeah, I'll, I'll give some use cases. Case. Yeah, I'll give some, I'll give some cases. Um, the main challenge is really getting your head around the domain knowledge that you would have had if you wanted. So for us, um, I think we were fortunate enough to be able to attract a lot of the people that understood the black boxes. Maybe not what was internal to the black boxes, which we may not want to use anyways, since a lot of the systems, at least in finance, are, are mainframe systems. I mean, you dig down into them, or they're giant Oracle 10 systems. And so for us, you know, understanding the interfaces on the outside of the black boxes was the most important piece. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's a secret sauce to that. I think it's just doing a lot of research. Um, and finding a lot of industry people and just finding people that are willing to talk about those systems. Um, I don't think we traded out too many technology vendors. I think they're kind of the entrenched kind of SaaS 
what well, they call themselves as. But for them, cloud is a newfangled thing. So for a lot of these, I'll give you an example. We were working with a bank, um, and the bank gave us a 40-page security questionnaire. And inside the security questionnaire, there's a mention of the word cloud once. Out of, out of 40 pages, no SaaS, no cloud, nothing. It was talking about you know, where, if, if I had to find a customer's <coughs> record, point to me the exact server at the exact time you know, where this record is. We we're, were trying to explain to them, well, let's, you know, we use um, platform as a service, so it could be on this node, and if performance gets bottlenecked on this server, then this virtual machine can move to this server. We had to explain all these things to them. And so, I don't know if there is a secret sauce to it, um, but for a lot of these vendors, um, you know, we did a lot of due diligence, and we really just had to trust ourselves at some point that we can develop in an iterative fashion, that as we learn, we can adapt to it. That's really the only secret sauce. And so, it came back to agility again. It was a, we went out there knowing that we didn't know a lot of things. Um, but the main pieces we, we dug up first were the pieces that scared the Jesus out of us, which usually had something to do with yeah, I was interested, um, did you develop your own credit model or did you acquire it? We did. We did. Um, but but the, the thing that I think is key is that we had people that had done it before. Um, and then, so the first approach we went out with is something that was um, comparable to everyone else. And then we, we started iterating from there. So a lot of the things that we implemented, we implemented in such a way that we could compare it to other comparables in the market to make sure that we were benchmarking. Um, when I mean benchmarking in financial benchmarking, we should that our financial products are performing in a way that we would expect, and then we get from there. Another hand. Um, so we use Macaw, we use um, Envision, there's a few more. If you send me an email at John and Payoff, I'll be happy to send you back an email. Thank you, we have a booth.